Hi, Jasmine. We've heard a lot about uh, adaptation in the negotiations here in Durban. Can you just give us a sense, what, is, what are we talking about here, adaptation? Yeah, so um, adaptation is the idea that you need to help uh, communities that are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change cope with those impacts. So it's building programming that can help uh, vulnerable communities cope with some of the specific impacts they are seeing. So, for example, disaster risk reduction is a type of adaptation. So that's working with um, groups that are vulnerable to the increasing impacts of disasters due to climate change and putting in place um, systems to help them be protected. So, for example, education to make them aware about what to do when a disaster strikes so that they don't feel the impact so badly. Or building structures and, you know, school buildings, community buildings that can withstand the impacts of a disaster so that they won't get knocked down and have to be rebuilt after the disaster hits. And UNICEF focuses primarily on children and youth. Uh, how is adaptation specifically related to children and youth? Okay, well, so um, children are often the most vulnerable in climate situations, so the need to ha have them be able to cope with the impacts of climate change is absolutely essential. So they need to, they're seeing a lot of their basic rights being impacted by the onset of climate change impacts. And so adaptation is core to making sure they can grow and develop. Give us some examples. So, for example, um, in Mozambique, that we're seeing, you know, increasing different um, changing rainfall patterns, so that um, rains don't come when they, um, communities expect them to come, or they come twice as much when they're not expecting them, or you know, completely hard to tell anymore. So, one thing that is effect that affects children is that they don't have a safe source of water for school, so they can't um, have clean, you know, clean hygiene, um, you know, good safe sanitation, and that's being that's because of the the water and the so what one, an adaptation response would be to build a rainwater harvesting system. So you could attach a big tank next to a school and you can gather the rain when it, when it is times of heavy rain and store that rain over the whole period of you know, several months to then be used over the course of the year so that you have a source when there isn't rain. And that means that there's consistent, you know, you're able to, you adapt to the changing, the changing nature of rainfall, but you're able to use that to continue life as normal. And how does all that play into the negotiations here in Durban? Yeah, so I mean, adaptation is a, a really big issue and un underlying a lot of what's going on in the negotiations at the moment. So the big discussion around the creation of the Green Climate Fund, which is um, it was put to the negotiations yesterday and is going to be ongoing discussion. The Green Climate Fund is expected to channel $100 billion a year of climate finance, half of which will be used to help communities adapt to climate change. So the, the need to set up this fund and make it operational as soon as possible is essential so that there's resources that will help um, those vulnerable, such as children or you know women, to have programming in place to help them adapt to climate change. In the past, at these negotiations, we've heard a lot of talk about mitigation, about uh, countries reducing their emissions levels. Are we hearing more about adaptation this time? Um, I would no. I don't. I think actually that's one of the issues that's probably you know one to flag is that we're not really hearing enough about adaptation. So it's hugely important to cut your emissions and to make sure countries commit to binding emissions reductions targets because we don't want to see further long-term impacts of climate change and worse impacts of climate change. But despite all that, we're still going to see impacts, and they're still as these negotiations go on and are a slow process. The the impacts of climate change are going to continue to you know impact on vulnerable communities. So. We actually need to be talking about adaptation more because in the interim while we're trying to get to an agreement we need to be um, making sure that communities are prepared to be able to cope with what they're seeing from climate change. And I think that while it's, it's often quite implicit, so it's implicit in the discussions around the Green Climate Fund and it's underlies some, it's not been explicitly on the table enough as it should be. And what's UNICEF's role in the talks here? So UNICEF is here basically doing two things. One, we're um, here to support the voices of children and young people in the negotiations. So we're talking about, um, we're here, you know, we've supported a delegation of um, 50 South African young people to come and, um, you know, talk about how climate change is impacting them and the solutions they'd like to, like to see and advocating for this as well with the, some of the negotiators. So our position is that everything that's being negotiated here in these big halls and all the complicated discussions that are being made will build a, a climate regime that's going to impact children in the future. So it won't be us and the negotiators here who will feel the, you know, the decisions being made here. It will be the children, children now. So they need to be able to have capacity to have their voice heard in these discussions because it's a, a climate treaty for their future. And I think the other, you know, really important issue similar to this is that if action is slow on, on getting a climate regime and a, you know, a new deal in place, then the economic costs and the climate impacts that will be felt in the future will be borne by children. So 
that you know they need to be they they're here to say we want you to take action because they don't want to experience this burden in the future. Are there voices being heard here? I think so. I think we've had a today's been Youth Day, so there's been a whole series of side events with different. Um, uh, with young people, UNICEF young people and some of the other organisations that supported um, children and young people to attend. And we had one this afternoon on intergenerational equity, which was attended by Cristiana Figueres. And it was very, you know, and they had a couple of negotiators, one from Brazil and one from Norway. And it was an excellent opportunity for um, children to say, this is what we think you should do. We need you to consider what we're, what, you know, our futures when you're negotiating. And you know. How was that received? Well, I think there would I mean one of the one of the UNICEF young people from South Africa gave a speech about, you know, about the importance of considering children and decision making and got a standing ovation. So it seems to have been quite, you know, quite positive. And then we've had a we had a discussion with the chair of the um, S SBI and the SB SBT can't remember the acronym. Um, about it's acronym soup acronym, here, isn't it? Too many acronyms <laughs> uh, about how to how young people can have a platform for their voice to be heard. In the in the closed doors and the closed um, the closed rooms of the negotiations, and he was very supportive of that statement and said that he would be holding a consultation on Monday to get stakeholder groups such as young people to discuss with him how he can help facilitate that. It's great news. So we're four days into the talks now. Uh, there are about seven or eight, nine more days to go. Uh, are you optimistic? How do you feel? Yeah, I think optimistic, but um, you know, cautiously optimistic. I think. Um, there is still space and um, movement for an agreement to be made on a second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol, and there's space for you know a mandate going forward for negotiations. And that's you know I mean it could possibly go wrong, but it, you know it's not all over yet. And in terms of the Green Climate Fund, I think that's you know an incredibly positive outcome that we could take away from um, from Durban. It looks like every country's going to you know bearing a few changes to some of the text. It looks like every country's going to sign on to it, and that's a you know, a fund that's going to channel $100 billion a year of funds for climate change and that's, um, you know, it's going to build a whole new architecture for delivering um, support to um, those who are vulnerable to climate change. And that's, you know, that can't be underestimated, the scale of that achievement, if that's the only outcome we get. Great. We'll, we'll watch for that. Thanks a lot, Jasmine.